This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The quest to make Pensacola America's first early learning city on this edition of In Studio. The man who has changed the face of Pensacola's downtown is now spearheading an effort to overhaul education. Through his Studer Community Institute, Quinn Studer and his team want to make Pensacola the nation's first early learning city. So what does that mean? How will it be accomplished? And what are the long-term effects on the community as a whole? On this edition of In Studio, we'll attempt to answer those questions and more. We'll be joined by participants from both inside and outside the Studer Community Institute. These are dedicated citizens who share the dream of drastically improving early childhood education. Shannon Nickinson had a successful career with the Gannett newspaper chain, including a 14-year stint with the Pensacola News Journal. She is now a project manager with Studer Community Institute. She is a graduate from Northwestern University. Bruce Watson served three decades in the United States Navy. He retired as a captain in 2009. He was previously executive director of Independence for the Blind of West Florida. Currently, he is executive director of the Early Learning Coalition of Escambia County. He has an undergraduate degree from the University of Louisville and a master's from Troy State University. Vicki Pugh is the Program Improvement Director at Early Learning Coalition of Escambia County. She is a native Pensacolian and a UWF graduate with over 20 years in the field of early childhood development. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Pleasure to have you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Tell me this, and I'll begin with you, Shannon. What is an early learning city? Uh, the great thing about it is it can be almost anything we want it to be because we're in the developmental stages. But what we think of at the Studer Institute when we think of an early learning city is a place that embraces parents and children in public spaces, in the healthcare system, in the school system, through our civic groups and businesses to encourage um, positive interaction between parent and child, which we know is the food for the developing brain. Let me ask you, Bruce, tell me a little bit about your organization, the Early, Early Learning Coalition of Escambia County. Well, we've been here for quite a while, actually, and uh, early education is what we're all about. Uh, we just celebrated our Sweet 16 uh, back in November, and our primary focus is twofold. Uh, most people probably know what is actually the smaller of our two missions, but it's no less important, and that is voluntary pre-kindergarten, otherwise known as VPK, where every four-year-old in the state of Florida is entitled to a year's worth of education the year before they would otherwise start kindergarten. Our other program is called School Readiness. That is where parents making less than 150% of federal poverty and working at least 20 or more hours a week can come to us and the state and federal government will help subsidize their childcare. We have about three to 3,200 children enrolled in that program on a daily basis. And so we are constantly taking care of and serving what I call the babies and the young children of this county. And, and Vicki, why do you guys want to be, your organization, why do you want to be involved with, the, um, with this program? With early learning? With our, no, I'm sorry, with the, with the uh, early learning city is what I'm trying to well, say. Well, because, <laughs> you know, it, it, that old saying, it does take a village to raise right. a child. But we're partners with everybody that's here today, uh, the Studer Community Institute, with eCare, with Achieve Escambia. We're part of that group because everybody knows a, a, a small child, plus everybody was a small child at right, one time. Right, right. So it's the place to be. It's really a lot of action going on in that birth to five. When, when you do your research at Studer Community Institute, what are you learning about the importance of children being educated at an early age? Well, I mean, really, those first three or four years of, your, of life are, are in many ways more important than all the education that comes after that because that's really the time when the wiring of your brain is laid. You know, our brain is a computer, and, um, and it will compute and and be as strong as the foundation that we give it. And that time, you know, we have all, we've all peaked. We reached our intellectual peak probably <laughs> by four or five because 85% of your brain develops before your fourth birthday and about 90% of it by age five. You, what that means is that you will never learn more, more easily 
-hmm. your whole life than you do then. And really investing in that time is critically important, not just to the success of the child that you're talking about, but to the school system that that child will enter and to the community that you want that child to grow up and be a part of. Dr. Robert Putnam is a Harvard uh, professor and he's also a very well-known and renowned author and he has studied the uh, topic of, uh, of early childhood education and also the economic disparities that are going on in this country and n not too long ago he uh, paid us a visit here and uh, was a part of uh, WSRE television's uh, speaker series, Public Square uh, speaker series and we also had the opportunity to talk with him on another program I do entitled Conversations. I want to play a clip about sort of what he was talking about, the importance of early childhood education, and then have you uh, comment on this. So, Mike, go ahead. My research team uh, has brought together 50 of the best experts in America on the question of how to narrow this opportunity gap, and we re produced a report called um, Closing the Opportunity Gap. Your viewers could go online to theopportunitygap.com and find this report, and it lists 75 different good ideas that have been shown to work. So I'm now gonna be drawing on those other people's ideas. I think the most important would be early child education, free, high quality early child education. By early child education, I mean beginning very young, okay. one or two up to kindergarten. We know there's very good research that that pays for itself because Poor kids without early child education begin school, be, be, enter K-12 school a year or two years behind kids from the other side of the tracks. And that's wasting the talents of these kids. Very interesting. Your thoughts? Um, you know, we have, part, we have a partnership with the University of Chicago and their economics department. They have uh, obviously really smart people who work there who, uh, based on research, can tell you that an investment, of a dollar's worth of investment in quality early childhood education can pay up to $13, save up to $13 of social investment later on. And that comes in the form of health, that's everything from health care to public service to social services to criminal justice spending. I think that part of what is exciting about the energy that this community has around the idea of an early learning city is that it's not just advocates or people that you would normally, who have had the passion for young children and how their brains develop for a long time, but that now the business community, the political community, other people see and begin, have begun to understand that investing in those children is really the kind of economic development that this community ought to be focused on. And that's a lot of what Dr. Putnam yeah. talked about when he was here, that, that in a world that is as connected as ours is, in an economy that is so interdependent on critical thinking skills and problem solving skills and your ability to get along with other people, we cannot afford to waste the talent that we are wasting in this community when we allow year after year anywhere between you know, a third, uh, up to 34% of our kids to show up to school without the best possibility to be ready. That's wasted talent. That's mm -hmm. wasted intellectual capacity. That's great novels never written. That's businesses never yeah. started or expanded. Um, you know, we can't afford, we can't afford as a community to allow that to go on. And that's something that actually doesn't get talked about a whole lot. What are your thoughts? Well, um, at the coalition, we, you know, we don't have any control over, we're not a social agency where we go out and do home visitation, mm -hmm. but we do a lot of work with our early education and care providers, um, practitioners, directors in those um, centers and homes that contract with us. Um, and so we've been working with some really cool new projects this year, gathering some data to help in that birth to three mm -hmm. age group because if it doesn't happen there, it's exactly what Shannon says. You know, it's, it's learning those social emotional skills, having that resiliency, learning self-control, and it comes from responsive care in those first three years. And what Vicki and her folks are doing is really important because professional development for people who work in that space has some, is something that has not traditionally existed in the education world. I, I mean, it's been only recently that people have really thought of of that as an educational time and not just a babysitting mm. time. 
investing in those folks is critically important because um, my kids went to daycare. They spent as much, almost as much time in a child care setting as they did with their parents. And that environment has to be rich and it has to be supportive um, to help bolster what my kids, like mine got at home, but what kids who come from different family situations than mine maybe don't get at home. A lot of that preparation for a great many of our adults happens naturally. They have the time, they have the energy, they have the desire to be good, responsible parents. And they're doing the things they need to do with their children, talking to them, playing with them, giving them opportunities to explore and to have their brain continue to be that little sponge that's capable of receiving anything and everything that its environment has to offer to it. For far too many of our children, though, that environment doesn't exist. They're still sponges and they're sucking up what they're getting, but what they're getting is not always to their benefit. They're in traumatic situations, they're in family situations that are extremely hazardous, if not detrimental to their health, before they even get to be three years old. Our ambition is for those who qualify and can get into our programs, that for at least eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week, sometimes more if we're uh, fortunate, we're putting that child into a safe environment and then also dealing with their educational needs as well as, to some degree, their emotional and developmental needs as well. We identify every child that needs, you know, has a developmental delay. We screen every child under the age of five. That is required. And then we, in turn, are working our best. And probably the biggest change in the past five years here in the state of Florida is a recognition of the educational component of what we're trying to achieve and not just the financial stability and the workforce development component. So we're actually taking early education a step further. And we're getting our children that much better repaired, but it starts with the adults. You gotta go to the adults and change their behaviors. You gotta make them realize, as Shannon said, you're not babysitters anymore, you're educators. And when you're 18 to 25 years old, right out of high school, you need all the help you can get. Right. Because they, in many cases, haven't had their own first child. Right. And so they really haven't seen the miracle. Well, we're letting them experience the miracle secondhand and on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. and making them part of the miracle. And that's where we are coming from, what we hope to achieve. And that's what the entire city is moving towards, thank goodness. Yes. How, do you go, how, do, how does a child get into your program, or how does a parent go about getting a child into some of your programs? You want to address that? Um, basically, they make an application. As I said, there's a cutoff for the school readiness program, subsidized mm -hmm. childcare, 20 hours a week of work, 150% of federal poverty or less for all the adults in the household. Go to our website, elcsgambia.org, and uh, click on application, and it'll take you to one of our two applications, either VPK if your child is four years old, or any other child under the age of 12. And make an application, we'll, we'll let you know if you qualify or not. And if you do, we'll put you on the wait list and we'll get you in as soon as we possibly can. Shannon, what can our community do to expand programs similar to this? Um, well, I've invested, obviously, investing in uh, the investment that our pub that goes from our public dollars into Vicki and, and Bruce's work is an incredible return. Um, that comes as a block grant from the federal government, so there's not a ton of local control necessarily <laughs> right. over that. Um, our local government agencies have, in recent years, stepped up some of their contributions, their matching contributions, which allow um, you all to get some folks off the wait list and get folks into the system. Um, I think that there are lots of ways that the community can become involved. Um, we are, some of us have, have our parents or grandparents. We, as Vicki said, we have all been a child. Right. Um, this concept that Dr. Putnam mentioned um, in his book, Our Kids, but he also mentioned in his talk the other night that when people think of our kids, what we think of when we say that um, has changed over time. And I, I, what we would like to do is expand that definition back to to something that resembles what what it meant when I grew up. I think when you when we all grew up that um, that our every kid was our kid, and we had a responsibility for all those kids. Because the bottom line, really, of all of that, is that we as parents and taxpayers we have a choice about how to pay on how to invest in those children. We can invest in programs like yours. We can invest in public spaces and learning opportunities that support parent-child interaction and learning in a fun and inviting way. Or we can pay for the outcome when we don't make that investment. And as, you know, as the, the return on investment is about one to 13, I would rather spend my money 
where I get one to, you know, where I spend one dollar and get thirteen dollars back, then I would rather pay for what comes at the end in a child who doesn't graduate you from high school. You had a great quote about prison. How much is it for one prison inmate? Oh, a, a, year? a year in the county jail mm -hmm. costs thirty-one thousand dollars. We as taxpayers pay for that. A year of VPK, the state of Florida pays about twenty-four hundred dollars mm -hmm. per child for that. Mm -hmm. Some states pay as much as seven or eight thousand. New Jersey spends fifteen thousand dollars per per four-year-old for VPK. So even at the upper, even at the uppermost reach of that, mm -hmm. right. I would rather spend that money than the thirty-one thousand so dollars at the end of the year. So for every inmate, I can put ten more children into childcare. Yes. And potentially ten less children into prison when they get to be mm -hmm. eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. Not to mention going back to what you were talking about a few minutes ago, the opportunity cost of maybe that Absolutely. child yeah. is the one that, you know, creates the next great software program or cures a disease or mm -hmm. something along those lines. Or just grows up to contribute to society in Absolutely. a positive way. You were talking about Dr. Putnam sort of uh, describing how things are different than perhaps when uh, all of us grew up. And um, in our interview, he sort of elaborated uh, about that. And uh, I want to play another clip, and it'll kind of give folks uh, an idea of what he was talking about. And I think, quite frankly, you'll say, yeah, he's, he's right. Mike, go ahead and roll that, please. The reason that the book has the title, Our Kids, mm -hmm. is that when I was growing up, in the 1950s in a small town in the Midwest and my parents or other adults talked about doing things for our kids. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, our kids need a swimming pool. We ought to save up and build a swimming pool for our kids. And they were not talking about my sister and me. They were talking about all the kids in town. And they were talking about a swimming pool in our backyard. They were talking about a pool that all the kids in town could use. Mm -hmm. They meant by the term our kids, we meant, they meant, all the kids in town. But now, if you listen carefully, over the last 30 or 40 years, the meaning of our kids has shriveled. So now when people talk about our kids are doing pretty well, they mean their own biological kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that shriveling of a sense of connection and responsibility to all the kids in town, that's the underlying cause. Yeah, he's absolutely right, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Spot on. How do you think we motivate our community to, to be more uh, inclusive and to be more um, open to the idea of, of adopting what he was talking about, making all the kids our kids? I think, um, I think a couple things that we all separately and together have kind of in the works are good steps toward that. Obviously, the Ladies of Impact 100 uh, supported the Brain Bag Project mm -hmm. uh, for, um, for the Studer Institute last year. This is an early literacy kit that will be given, uh, started going out last month to every new mom in all three of the county's birthing hospitals. Um, it comes with a little lesson about some of the things we've been talking about on early brain development and why it's so important to talk to and interact with your kid um, from the very, I mean, from the before he or she is born, but certainly from those first days and hours in the hospital from the time you go home. Um, we, in the brain bag, is uh, P is for Pelican. It is a really cute alphabet book uh, that uses landmarks in the community to teach the ABCs. It's by a local author, Anna Terrio. She's a licensed mental health counselor, too. And the author previously of Goodnight Pensacola. Um, but we chose this book because it uses the community, landmarks in the community, to tie to, the, to a letter of the alphabet. So, you know, the hope is that you begin to see that the B and the beach ball and the A for Argos and um, the W for Wahoos, all those things are around you. It's part of the idea of seeing the community as a classroom. Kind of once you begin to think of it that way, it's kind of hard to think of it as, any, as anything else. Um, you begin to see shapes and colors and let's count, let's count and let's measure, compare bigger and smaller, all those concepts. That's part of why we chose this book specifically. And it's double bang for the buck because now you're not only educating the child, you're educating the parent on how to be a better educator. Sure. And the book is written specifically at a reading level that should be good for all of our parents no matter what their, what their background. Um, the, another cool aspect of the brain bag is the Baby Steps Baby Book which is a developmental guide mm -hmm. for uh, a young child's brain development, especially focused in the first three years, but it will go up to age five. And this is 
developed with input from folks like Vicki and kindergarten uh, and uh, kindergarten teachers, nurses, lots of folks gave us their help with this and it draws on some research at the University of Chicago mm -hmm. and it also includes um, the ages and stages questionnaire. So it's got a little checklist at 6, 9, 12, 18, 24, and 36 months um, for mom to look at and to see, you know, just kind of as a rule of thumb, are we, are we good on here? Are we not good on here? We want this book to, to live at least three years um, so you can take it with. Uh, when you leave the hospital, take it with when you go to your well baby appointments, have a place to write your questions. I always forgot everything I was going to ask sure. the second I walked into the doctor's office. <laughs> uh, so I would have appreciated having this with me. Um, and a binder that has uh, some community resources, information on how to choose a great child care from, from uh, Vicki's folks and library hours and story times and all kinds of uh, resources because these things do exist in the community. They don't, they haven't always been kind of talking to each other and been in a really accessible place for everyone and so this is just a small way to start that conversation. And this goes out to everyone regardless of income? Is that Absolutely. Correct? We have about 5,000 births every year in Escambia County and the ladies of Impact 100 are making sure that the 5,000 babies born this year will all go home with this and not just have it handed to them but have kind of a a, a few moments to really talk and focus um, and the hospitals, all three of them, Baptist, Sacred Heart and West Florida, were totally embracing of the idea. They see it as part of their mission. They want those babies when they leave their care to have to have a good start. Wow. And there's no reason why a parent shouldn't consider early education if the opportunity presents itself. You don't have to be low income necessarily to put your child into good quality child care. Mm -hmm. And it's more than child care, it is early education. So if you don't feel like you're equipped to do all the things that it would take educationally to get your child ready before they turn three, then consider if you have the resources, and a, a great many of our uh, providers will also, what we call scholarship, they'll work with the parents. If you don't make necessarily enough money to afford their full-time private rate, they may very well work with you. But we need to increase the private participation in our child care community. We have one of the lowest percentages of participation in child care, early education, amongst the counties here in Florida. Um, almost all of our providers are solely reliant or predominantly reliant on the state and federal funding. I would like to see that shift the other way so that we actually have a very robust, you know, fully participatory uh, involvement in our child care. I'm happy to say though with, that uh, our hospitals mm -hmm. as employers, Navy Federal, Gulf Power and various others have come to the realization we need this that they need employees in the future. And in order to be able to do that and to do it with homegrown local resources, we've got to increase the number of children to successfully graduate from high school. The way to do that is increase the number that come in the front door ready for kindergarten. Makes because a, that same makes, statistic carries all the way through 12 you know, makes years a lot of, of education. Sense. Makes an awful lot of sense. Vicki, tell me what you have here. Well, Shannon and her group are, with their brain bags, are working with parents. Mm -hmm. What we work with uh, in this project, it's called Grow With Me, and it's an infant toddler initiative uh, using three-pronged effect. We're using professional development based on a class observation, which is um, a nationally normed tool that uses uh, instructional support, teachers, positive and negative climate. It assesses the teacher interaction with the child. Okay. And then this little gadget is called ALENA, which stands for Language Environmental Analysis. So it gets turned on in our Grow With Me classrooms, put on this little vest. This is a three to six month vest. And um, it records all day. <laughs> Uh, the adult child conversational turns. So you're thinking, well, a baby doesn't talk, but a baby coos. Mm -hmm. So if that baby's getting responsive care and, and teachers talking to them, singing to them, just telling them, you know, here I want to wash your hands after I diaper you, those start building those little neurons in that brain. Um, it was first perfected at the University of Chicago uh, to use with parents. Later this summer, we're partnering with Studer and we're going to introduce it to three parent groups. So what we're hoping is there'll be one day of recording in our Lena, in our Grow With Me classrooms, and then they'll go home that night with some of our Grow With Me parents and we'll really start seeing changes in children. We have some phenomenal um, data 
from this. Um, it magically goes up into the clouds when the, you know, the iCloud, right. when <laughs> um, the computer gets hooked up to it. And um, we find out meaningful noise, non-meaningful noise in a classroom, how many conversational turns the teacher has with little Vicky. Um, the goal right now is to get seven to 10 minutes an hour. Wow as um, a norm. The meaningful noise in a classroom uh, for early education is about 40%. We're not there yet, but we're also in classrooms where you're having to um, change a lifetime of just poor habits. Mm. Just oh. poor habits, you know, so it, it won't happen overnight. Mm. But what makes this special is you can't argue with your own data. Right. We do a little pretest. UWF helped us with the pretest. And, you know, how often do you think you talk to children? Oh, I talk to them a lot, at least. 10 to 20 minutes an hour. Well, then when you go back in and say, no, you're talking one minute an hour. You, you can't argue with your own data. Right, right. So it's really been a great jumping off point uh, for my coaches to go in. We have phenomenal staff that go in and work with um, the teachers on this. What has been so amazing is Dr. Dana Suskind from the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. she you know, initiated all this, and then the Lena Research Foundation grew out of that. And then she came down here about a year ago and uh, gave a uh, presentation to all of us, and we both were sitting in the room. We went back, and Vicki goes, we can do things with this that no one has ever done before. No organization in the entire country has done this institutionally. Up to this point, 100% parents. We took it into a child care uh, situation, uh, environment. They had to rewrite the software to accommodate the fact that in, they weren't in a quiet home anymore. They were in a child care and there's twos and there's threes and there's fours and there's children running and crying and everybody's Control having a good chaos. time. And, uh, <laughs> and so they had to redevelop the software to get that good noise versus right. the bad noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are at the cutting edge. We are the first ever, we have a hundred children right now using this device on a daily basis. I need to wrap things up here and go to break, but as I get ready to close out, if folks want to learn more about your organization, how do they do so? Uh, I would go to our website and then get our contact information. Okay. We'd love to talk to them. ELCSGambia.org. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is the foundational pieces that go to make us an a learning city. They really are. And yeah. Shannon, as far as what the Studer Institute is doing? Oh, studeri.org is where all of uh, all the action is. All right, sounds great. Thank you all. First of all, thank you for all you do for our community. Thank you. Great information. I think we all learned an awful lot. Very special thanks to Shannon Nickinson of the Studer Community Institute. Also, Bruce Watson and Vicki Pugh from the Early Learning Coalition of Escambia County. When we come back, we learn about eCare and the role they are playing in early childhood education as we continue our discussion on the quest to make Pensacola America's first early learning city. You're watching WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Early education really does ensure school success later on and life success. So many children actually do not get a chance to get high quality early education. Low income families start with so many risks and barriers. High quality educational media can have a positive impact on early learning, especially in low income communities. The most critical years are from birth to five. That's when most of the brain development takes place. Early opportunities in language arts and reading and math provide the foundational understanding for success later on. And this is where PBS Kids can play and does play a huge role. PBS Kids content works and our research has shown that kids have made positive and significant gains in their mathematics learning after using PBS Kids content. It's actually really amazing. There's a lot of active learning going on. They're problem solving together, and we find that using the PBS Kids content has really empowered parents and made them feel more confident and able to help support their kids in their learning. As a working single mother, I need all the help I can get. PBS Kids helps me as a parent reinforce the values that are important to me. I think that PBS Kids certainly recognizes that they're onto something here. Whether it's TV or the app or the games, you have that whole palette of opportunities for children. School readiness is important for not only the child, it's important for the family, it's important for the community, it's important for the nation. You're 
watching in the studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, the quest to make Pensacola America's first early learning city. We're joined now by representatives from eCare, every child a reader in Escambia. Jennifer Grove is Community Development Manager for Gulf Power Company. In addition, she is a founding board member of eCare, chair of the Florida Chambers Business Alliance for Early Learning, and on the boards for the Florida Education Foundation and Leadership Florida. Reggie Dogan specializes in early childhood education and parent outreach in his role as project manager for the Studer Community Institute. He is a former journalist and columnist, having worked at both the Herald in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and the Pensacola News Journal. He is also an eCare Reading Pal volunteer. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. E-Care, what is it, Jennifer? So E-Care stands for Every Child a Reader in Escambia. It is an organization that was founded many years ago in 2007, really focused on really trying to figure out how could we align our community resources to embrace all of our children, as Dr. Putnam said, to make sure they're all ready for kindergarten. Reggie, how did you get involved in it? Well, uh, E-Care Director Ashley Bodner and uh, Coordinator Julia Brady invited us to a recruitment luncheon. And when she invited me, I remember years ago I was a take stock. Well, I'm a take stock in, in children mentor now and also was a youth motivator at Scamia County. And I figured that if I'm going to live the vision of the Student Community Institute, which is to improve the community for everyone, as well as to seek the vision, which is to uh, make Pensacola the best place in America, it was a no-brainer to be an e-care reader. Uh, reading to me is, is fundamental, but it's like breathing, it's like eating. Uh, reading has taken me to places that I've never been before. Mm -hmm. It's exposed me to so many different people and places. Uh, without reading, I never would have been a journalist. Uh, my mother was a, a, a high school, well, she didn't make it to high school, but she read the newspaper, she read books, read magazines around the house. I remember when I was a child, the door-to-door -door salesman came through. Uh, back in the day when they did that, they sold us a collection of encyclopedias yeah. and child craft books. I just got absorbed into those things. I mean, I was into sports too, but reading is so important. So I figured if I could help another young child read, that would be a great uh, way to give back to the community. And that's a large focus of our program here is talking about mentoring and talking about the community getting involved. And you mentioned Dr. Putnam, who is the renowned Harvard professor and author who has written a great deal on this subject. And he visited our area not too long ago. I had the opportunity to speak with him on my other program called Conversations. I want to share a little clip here. We'll have our guest comment. There are things that all of us need to do, like providing mentorship. It used to be one way to think about it is all kids do dumb things. Sure. Um, kids, black kids, white kids, rich kids, poor kids, maybe even kids in Pensacola do dumb things. You know, they get in a fight with a teacher or they drink too much or they get involved with drugs or whatever. And the, but when kids on this side of town do some dumb thing, they instantly because from their family and friends and their parents' friends and their teachers and their coaches and their clergymen and so on, instantly airbags inflate to protect the kid from the worst consequences of that dumb decision. So if one of my grandchildren, God forbid, we should discover is involved in drugs, the first thing I do is find the best lawyer in town and the second thing I do is to find the best rehab facility in right. town. And I don't apologize for that. That's what loving parents sure. or grandparents do. Sure. But when a kid from this side of the town does exactly the same dumb thing, no airbags, right. no people around them. Because these kids over here are surrounded by, and that's great, loving parents and neighbors and so on, and these kids are increasingly isolated. And what that means is a lot of us on this side of town could be doing more mentoring for kids on this side of town. And by mentoring, I don't mean just saying, you know, once a year showed up and having lunch and saying, how's your, how's your life, kid? Right, right. That's not what we do with our own kids. What right. we do with our own kids is help them progress. And, and that's what we need to do. In an earlier America, that's what we did. We did worry about other people's kids too, not just our own. Yeah. So there's plenty of opportunity for nonprofits and private sector organizations to help with the problem. Your, your thoughts? Yeah. I, I agree completely, and Reggie's a great example of how people can get involved to be a reading pal. This year we have 219 reading pals. 
Um, that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. We started this program in 2010. It's part of a larger program called Project Ready. So as was mentioned previously, um, Project Ready focuses on teacher professional development, critical. Also, family engagement. So how can we help the family understand how to nurture their young developing readers and learners at home? And then the Reading Pal component, which is that direct mentoring relationship. So we have 219 now. The reality is we know we have over 1,000 students who start kindergarten not ready to learn every year. We hope to achieve 250 Reading Pal matches next year and then more and more until we get to a, you know, a good representation of what we need to cover. How, how old do you have to be to be a Reading Pal? I'm, I'm curious, can high school students, is this something high school students can do? So we actually have the, um, some high school students that are in our early childhood development academies involved in the program, but not serving in the one-on-one -on -one relationship. Our goal is to bring an adult, adult okay. um, into the a relationship for that consistent sure. weekly presence. Mm -hmm. It's an gotcha. hour a week, okay. and we strive for at least 25 weeks a year okay. to have that connected um, relationship. There is a curriculum um, that is tied to what the students are supposed to be learning at that time. There mm -hmm. is a space that is different than the classroom that the Reading Pal takes the students, and the students really look forward to this. this is something they can count on mm -hmm. every week. So we're trying to bring an adult, uh, a connected relationship. Sure. Reggie, I want you to share the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking before we went on the air sure. about your personal story mm -hmm. of uh, how uh, someone mentored you sure. and, and made a big difference in your life. Sure. I was a senior in high school and uh, no one in my immediate family had gone to college. My older brother had gotten a scholarship uh, to play football and when he visited the school he didn't particularly want to go there so he stayed home and went to work but he ended up going later. But there was a high school substitute teacher in my senior year and uh, I was in class and it was a class that I was competing with another student to get the best grade so I wanted to work hard in that class. You know when you have a substitute kids tend to cut up but these two students, she and I, we were working really hard so when I turned my paper in the substitute asked me what was my name and I said Reggie Dogan. And she said, well, do you have a brother named Charles? I said, yes. She said, well, he was a real good student. She said, what do you plan to do when you finish school? I said, well, probably get a job, but I would love to go to college if I could. She said, where do you want to go? I said, University of South Carolina or somewhere in South Carolina. She said, I'll tell you what, uh, this lady was in her late 70s, early 80s, white female. She said, Reggie, I'm going to take you around to colleges that you want to visit. And she actually helped me fill out all my applications. She never met my parents. She never came to my house. After school, we would drive 100 miles to Columbia, South Carolina, 30 miles up to Spartanburg, South Carolina. She never asked for gas money. Uh, I know why she. I knew she was kind of old because she had me to drive back from <laughs> Columbia. It was nighttime, <laughs> and when I got back, uh, she followed up with me each year when I got accepted to school. She, I thought about going to law school, and another another uh, teacher encouraged me to go into journalism. For years we stayed in contact and then one day I was looking at the uh, obits and saw she had passed but we stayed in contact. But this was a lady who understood the value of our lives being a village, the value of we all being each other's children. She never asked me for anything, she never called my parents, but I thought as I was thinking this morning when I was getting prepared to come to work, for the first time in a long time I, 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 I teared up thinking about her because I thought what if I didn't go to school that day or what if the teacher showed up that day and the substitute wasn't there? What if she had never taught my brother? What if she didn't become that, that God in light who saw value in me, who, who saw something that other people may have not have seen? And this is a young black male whose grandfathers were sharecroppers, whose parents who dropped out of high school and, and, and even didn't even make it to high school because they had to work. And then I was able to go to college. I was able to do what I want to do. I met so many great people. I met Jennifer Groves. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I met people all over the, the world. I've interviewed Michael Jordan. I've met, I mean, presidents and vice presidents because of my job. I never would have had that opportunity if this lady had not saw something in me. That's amazing. Amazing. There's so much that so many of us can do. I would put another plug in for employers. We have a little bit of a friendly competition going on in Pensacola. Um, employers can help free up their employees um, during work hours mm -hmm. to mentor at many levels. I'm a big fan of the Reading Pals. That's the investment made at a, um, I don't know that we mentioned it, but Reading Pals is at pre-K centers, so it is for four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, and Landrum, 
companies, Studer Institute, Studer Community Institute and Studer Group, Gulf Power, Navy Federal, mm -hmm. lots of employers really are trying to get as many reading pals involved as possible. And there's really so much that large employers, small employers, individual citizens, we have lots of retired educators, retirees of other sorts that are involved as reading pals. It's a great way to feel like you're still connected to the community helping to mentor a child and really making a significant difference. The, those zero to five years really are so critical in determining the trajectory of a child's life. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we can all do to contribute more in those ages. And you said there's sort of a curriculum that there someone is. follows. So yes. they don't, it's not like they have to do a lot of oh, yeah. prep work. That's or exactly right. That's right. And um, we would provide the developmental results. Um, all of our students that are in VPK yes. are mm -hmm. tested three times a year mm -hmm. um, in four areas on an AP1 test, AP2 right after Christmas, and then AP2. AP3 at the end of the year. So you get that information on your PAL so you can see which areas, um, we're tested in four areas, print knowledge, phonological awareness, math, and oral language and vocabulary. You can see where your student mm -hmm. is doing so you know what activities that are provided for you mm -hmm. to use to really help the student in the areas that they need the most help. We provide training, we're recruiting now. Um, so we'd love for folks to go to the eCare website, um, escambiareads.org, and sign up. We're going to provide training and really try to hit that 250 sure. next Next year, um, we love our return volunteers. Um, and sometimes if it doesn't work for you to have a reading pal all on your own, we have a lot of folks who share a pal. So you can alternate weekly with another person if you can't make that weekly commitment so that we can get more of our students, particularly those high need students, matched with the reading pal. Well, that's what I like about eCare is that it's turnkey. You, know, you walk in the door, you have your books, you have your packets, you have your kits and all those things. And she also mentioned something that was important, which is that the employers are involved. Uh, I work for companies that allowed me the opportunity to do that, the News Journal, uh, in 1998 when the uh, FCAT scores came out. Right. Scammon County had the only two failing ele elementary schools. We adopted Spencer Bibbs and A.A. A. Dixon and News Journal sent a cadre of uh, employees to go into those schools and then Quinn Stude, of course, he allows us to mentor. So a lot of employers do do that, some don't. Uh, one thing I would encourage is that uh, I find it uh, sometimes frustrating that uh, I don't see as many mentors that look like me even though we're mentoring kids that look like me. Uh, maybe they can't do it, they don't know about it, but the kids need to see folks that look like them so that they can learn their struggles and, and their sacrifices, learn their successes, as well as uh, uh, some of the things they had to deal with in their life. I think the kids relate to me pretty well, but when he sees me, as opposed to seeing a basketball player, he said, well, maybe I want to be a journalist. I don't want to be a basketball right. player. Uh, in their community, they don't always see professional successful people they may see them on TV but to see one in real life so I encourage my my brothers and my sisters to come out and, and, and join eCare and, and Youth Motivators. Absolutely. The only other thing I'll mention is um, we've been doing Reading Pals in Escambia County for quite a while, um, but more recently at the state level, um, the Barnetts um, of Publix, Barnetts, mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. sponsored Reading Pal communities across the state of Florida, and there are 15 of those communities. We have the third most volunteers of all of these much larger communities across the state of Florida that are involved in the Reading Pals program. So it really has legs beyond Escambia County. A um, lot of great ways to get involved, and we'd really encourage everybody thinking individually or at an organizational level how they can get involved. And, and again, that website is just ecare.org? You can look up ecare or escambiareads.org. Okay, yes. Great. Thank you so much for your time and great stories. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Jennifer Grove and Reggie Dogan here on In Studio. When we return, the role WSRE Television and PBS are playing in early childhood education as we continue our discussion about the quest to make Pensacola America's first early learning city. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're back after the short break. American Graduate is proud to recognize a champion for education. Pensacola not only has the opportunity, but the responsibility to become America's first early learning city. Right now, we have about 3,000 children who come to kindergarten in Escambia County every year, and about 1,000 of them aren't ready. We realize if we're going to make an impact in the community education, we would have to start when the kids are young, and we realize that kindergarten readiness was so, so important. The Studer Community Institute is very focused in the, in the birth to five space and what we found was that the path to explain all of our our issues with high school graduation with 
eighth grade reading with third grade math with first grade retention all start really before a child ever gets to school and what that would mean would be that not only do great preschools and child care centers embrace the power of uh, language to build brain development but all the aspects of our community understand the power that there is in language to build a young child's brain and they embrace that and they see their part in it and we want to help them do that and those kids when they're ready for kindergarten they'll be good readers at third grade and if they're on task and reading at grade level at third grade they're much more likely to graduate on time and pursue whatever higher education goals they might have so if we can just do one thing in this community to make it a different, to make it better. It's making sure those children, from the day they're born, or even before they're born, the parents and everybody in the community says, we want this child to maximize their brain development and they're ready for kindergarten. Because why? Because every child deserves the best chance to be successful. The Studer Community Institute, helping children in our community find the path to success in school and in life. For more stories of champions, visit americangraduate.org. You're watching In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, the quest to make Pensacola America's first early learning city. To achieve this goal, there's no question, it will have to be a team effort. WSRE Television is a part of that team. To discuss the role WSRE is playing, we are joined by Jill Hubbs, Educational Services Director for WSRE. Jill is also an accomplished documentary filmmaker and a former school teacher. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Tell me what WSRE is doing to help in the community as far as early education is concerned. Well, there are so many things that, um, that we are able to provide, um, resources that um, help not only parents, but teachers and students to um, achieve that success, uh, not just in school, but you know, success in life. Uh, you think of all the PBS programming alone um, that deals with not just educational things, but also social issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, how do you get along with others? How do you be a good neighbor to others? You know? right, right. But I can think of so many shows where, um, that really make a difference in, in a child's education to help build that strong foundation. Uh, WSRE is, our mission is education and always has been. We're celebrating 50 years of, of bringing that to our community and um, it starts with great programming, but it also is the outreach services and connections with our schools and our parents and the community that make a huge difference too. You know, throughout this program, we've been talking about the importance of getting an early start. In other words, for children to hear, you know, uh, many words and to be read to and things of that nature. And I don't want to get into patting ourselves on the back type situation here, but the fact of the matter is, if you go back for many, many years, what that's kind of what PBS has brought to the broadcast airwaves, you know, with Sesame Street and things Absolutely. of that nature. Elaborate on that. You're, you're an educator first and foremost, right? Well, and let me just say, you know, when I, for many years, I taught preschool school first and first grade, kin kindergarten. And I always knew instantly without anyone telling me which children had had adults in their lives who had read to them, mm -hmm. who had taken them on experiences, you know, who had had a, a, a language rich environment for their kids because those children used that vocabulary um, in a meaningful way and understood it. <clears throat> um, not, and you, we have to remember too that parents are their child's first and most important teachers. A lot of parents don't feel like, you know, that I'm not their teacher. I mean, they'll learn that when they get to school. But just as we've talked about in this program, what happens before you ever get to school really lays the foundation for whether or not you're going to be successful right. in school. And um, so WSRE is a PBS station and as part of Pensacola State College, you know, as a, as a community member, um, we offer great programming. Right. Um, like you just mentioned, um, you know, there are programs uh, such as Martha Speaks that helps build vocabulary. Absolutely. Um, we are available to anyone over the air, so it's a free resource. Right. And, um, you know, the kids love PBS because of the iconic characters. They love, you know, the Sesame Street characters and, and uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog and Arthur and, you know, Martha from Martha Speaks. Mm -hmm. So those characters engage them. But, um, but the programs themselves are built on curriculum. And that's, as a teacher, that's what I loved when uh, 
I, I love the fact that every single PBS program for kids was built on a curriculum. What do you want children to learn from watching this? You know, what is the takeaway? Um, very important. And then partnering that with outreach services, um, working with parents and um, doing workshops with teachers and um, uh, just being part of events in the community where we share resources you know, with, with the adults who are making a difference in these children's lives. And, and that's something a lot of people may not understand. Talk about um, the, the outreach services and, and the connection with the uh, teachers in the area. What, what happens? What are you doing? For years, for over 20 years, we've provided uh, ready to learn uh, workshops for parents and working with, um, for instance, the schools with Title I schools and um, community organizations to help parents um, realize the, the wealth of free resources that are there at their fingertips for their children. Um, it's great that kids watch educational programming, but how can you take that beyond that and make it even more meaningful and make the learning experience more powerful? And so, uh, yes, workshops at schools and with uh, community organizations and events where we, you know, parents may not even realize that there are all these great educational programs that they can use as a tool. It's a mm -hmm. resource, a tool to just strengthen that foundation. So you're actually going into the schools as well and working with teachers, right? Into the schools, working with teachers. We do a lot of uh, teacher um, education uh, workshops and conferences. Um, one of the resources that we use is uh, PBS Learning Media. PBS Learning Media is a uh, free resource that has hundreds of thousands of not only clips, educational clips, but uh, documents and photographs from the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and it's a way for um, teachers or any adult, parents and students, at your fingertips, um, lots of clips. Let's just say you're in a fourth grade science class and you're talking about gravity. Some, a child asks you a question, you've got that teachable moment, you can go to PBS Learning Media, put in what grade level, you know, science, mm -hmm. what exact, uh, you know, specific topic you're looking for, and it will give you every resource there is that, you know, whether it's video clips or pictures or documents or whatever, just a, a way to help um, strengthen that foundation. You know, just great resources for teachers to use, for parents to use, or even students on their own to do research. So you're telling me it actually breaks it down, for example, grade level. Grade level, genre, wow. everything, you know. So, uh, yes. And but the nice thing about it is, too, it's also written to the national state st and uh, the state, Florida state standards for, for us in Florida, too. Yeah. So it, it's a great companion tool that um, the schools are using, teachers are using, and it's there for anyone. Um, if they just go to WSRE.org and they can click on PBS Learning Media and just explore it. Interesting. How has technology changed the way we learn in recent years? Completely. Uh, if I was to go back in the classroom, now it would be a totally different experience. I, I hate to admit that when I left, we actually had real chalkboards. Right. You don't see chalk much <laughs> more anymore in school. There's, you know, the digital, the smart boards, and the kids right. have the iPads and the Chromebooks, and, and, you know, kids are using digital devices, which is, a, uh, you know, it can be a great resource. You don't want to be the only thing that you're using. But that's another thing about PBS, about WS3, is that we have all of these uh, resources, digital resources that are available at your fingertips uh, for, you know, parents or teachers or kids to use, and it's all free. And it's yeah. all based on curriculum and, and um, to help kids be successful. Um, just on pbskids.org is another good example. There are games and activities and, um, uh, you know, on um, Martha Speaks, for example. Mm -hmm. They have all these games and activities that help you strengthen your vocabulary so that um, if you are on that, you know, the kids are having a great time. They mm -hmm. love Martha, but they're learning some big vocabulary words that'll come in handy, you know, yeah. in their school experience. So pbskids.org has got not just the games and activities, but there's printable things there, there's videos. Um, you can stream now, we have the 24-7 uh, um, PBS Kids channel that you can watch on your TV, but you can also stream it to any device, also free. So um, that's another great resource. Um, Interesting. You know. I didn't, I'm, I'm learning a lot myself. I, I know I can speak from personal experience. Our daughter uh, has a, a wonderful uh, vocabulary and she was a huge fan of Martha Speaks. Of course, yes. she loved dogs and the fact that the dog was talking was really cool. So she picked up all these great words and, and um, we ultimately ended up with a dog named Martha. But <laughs> was kinda, I love that story too, that's yeah, great. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, I mean, so, so we, we saw that uh, in, in, in real life, in real time, so to speak.
Um, talking about community involvement, uh, one of the things that WSRE has that is uh, quite high profile out at the Wahoos um, Stadium is the Imagination Station. So yes. what, what is the Imagination Station? It is a hands-on, fun place for kids and adults to come. Um, it's totally free, and the focus is on having fun, but also learning. Um, and we probably have more of a focus on the birth to, to five-year-old, getting kids ready for uh school but we do have older kids that come in with their brothers and sisters and younger siblings and have a good time and we have uh, touch screen computers in there puzzles lots of books uh, you know games and activities and um, we are open um, several days a week to the public mm -hmm. and uh, we have a lot of parents come in there grandparents a lot of dads stay-at-home dads are coming now um, we have a lot of community groups that use it too that we we dedicate a couple days a week to community groups so we've had um, head start groups come uh, Autism Pensacola, the new parent support group from Pensacola NAS, um, uh, easy uh, early steps. You know, there's just a lot of groups that use it as a, a meeting place to work with parents and children. Um, it is a uh, no pressure, just a place to have fun, but kids are learning while they're there. And I'm really proud of it. It's a first of its kind um, for any PBS station. It's a great partnership that we started uh, with Quint and Rishi Studer. Mm -hmm. and, um, like we're going on our fifth year, or so, wow. and um, it's just a it's a great resource that we are proud of. That um, is just another way to take learning beyond the screen, beyond whether it's we're watching television or using one of those digital devices, and to come and and be a part of the experience. You, you were a teacher, and so obviously you know a lot more about this than I do. But I know people learn in different ways. I guess some people learn by you know actually you know being able to touch something and see how it's put together. Other folks maybe learn better reading or watching video or whatever. It, it, and, and is it incorporate that type of approach? Yes, and you know um, learning is a very individual experience. Like you mentioned, everyone learns a different way. So there's a lot of different things that you can experience down there, and it's very adult led by whether it's your parent that brings you in or your grandparents or your whoever, you know, or teachers. Um, the adults kind of lead the way, but there's so many different <laughs> ways that kids can learn. And, um, and we're trying to offer a variety of resources down there and um, uh, also workshops for teachers and parents from time to time. We have uh, music and movement activities. Um, we have uh, later on in the, uh, we're going to have some of the Wahoos players come and share books. I mean, we've had a oh, lot neat. of different things happen down there. But the focus is on having fun, but also learning. And it's not just open during the time the ball game's going on, right? Oh yeah, it's open for every game. Um, oh. We are open an hour before first pitch, and we have a lot of people that come in and uh, come and go. We got the game on on our big screen television, okay. so uh -huh. um, you know it's a, a good place for the the little ones. And the, the whole idea is to to be a part of this uh, focus on becoming and building America's first early learning city. WSRE has been doing just that for many years, and we want to be a part of this initiative and to help, you know, with uh, with our very youngest citizens. Awesome. Well, Jill, always a pleasure. Sit down and have a conversation with you. And, uh, you know, I always learn so much myself because, you know, there's so many things going on. You can't keep up with everything. So it's always <laughs> nice. not only does the audience get briefed on what WSRE and PBS are doing, but I do as well. So wonderful. Keep up the great work and enjoy your uh, enjoy your time at the Imagination Station. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Jill Hubbs joining us here. She is our Educational Services Director at WSRE Television. Recently, WSRE hosted renowned author and Harvard professor Dr. Robert Putnam as part of our Public Square Speaker Series. Dr. Putnam's latest book, entitled Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, addresses the growing educational and economic gap in America. You can see a long-form interview I did with Dr. Putnam on my show, Conversations with Jeff Weeks. The program is available at wsre.org slash conversations and also on YouTube. By the way, you can learn more about making Pensacola America's first early learning city at studeri.org. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself. We'll see you soon.